Good evening and welcome to this Cambridge Centre for Geopolitics panel on the topic of geopolitics of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. My name is John Freeman. I'm a research assistant at the Centre for Geopolitics Cambridge. I'm very glad that you can all join us for what I'm sure will be an excellent and stimulating event. This panel is the last of the calendar year for the Centre's Baltic programme. Over the past year, our programme, co-led by Professor Brendan Sims and the Right Honourable Charles Clark, has handled various topics relating to current debates and problems in the Baltic Sea region, but always with an eye on history. Tonight is one of our more historically focused events as we investigate one of the more unique polities in early modern Europe. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth developed out of a dynastic union between Jadwiga of the Kingdom of Poland and Jogaila, called later Jagiełło upon his conversion to Christianity of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. In 1659, Poland and Lithuania became closer through a formal political union, the Union of Lublin. Geopolitics was arguably a motivating factor in these unions, as an external threat, not least from Muscovy, loomed large. As well as the titular territories, this Commonwealth also encompassed a diverse set of communities, cultures and lands, including Ukraine, Ruthenia, parts of Livonia, as well as Prussia. Commonwealth is especially noteworthy for its political culture in which the nobility elected the king and maintained a number of privileges. Perhaps most infamously, the liberum veto allowed an individual to block legislation and nobles could also launch confederations to force through political agendas, often violently. The so-called golden liberty attracted praise and condemnation in equal measure, marveled at for its democratic spirit, although only for a small elite, but also maligned as anarchy in other corners. And the system left the Commonwealth indisposed to reform and vulnerable to foreign meddling. In 1791, King Stanislaw II, August Poniatowski, attempted to reactify the situation via the 3rd of May constitution, which attempted to rebalance the Commonwealth's political structures. The effort was in vain, as Russia, Prussia, and the Habsburg Empire forced three partitions, which ultimately led to the Commonwealth's demise. We have invited three expert speakers, uh, and I invite them to um, turn on their microphones so that we can see them, um, to investigate some of the aspects of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, including its geopolitical challenges, its place in the early modern Baltic, and whether it was quite such a political mess as some of its critics have suggested. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Robert Frost, Dr. Anna Kalinowska, and Professor Richard Buswick Pavlikowski, who I'll be introducing properly when each of them begins their presentation. But first, I will do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the form format of this webinar is as follows. We have three speakers, each of whom will speak for around 10 to 15 minutes. After that, we will open up the floor to questions from both me and from you, the audience. You are very welcome to send in your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, which you can do so via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. If you would like to submit a question, please mention your name, your affiliation, and if necessary, who the question is for. Both me and my assistant behind the scenes, Dr. Donatus Kupchunas, will try our best to get to all of them during the course of the evening. The event will be recorded and you will be able to revisit it on our YouTube page. Um, in addition, you can see the rest of our past events. Future events can be viewed on our website or sent straight to you if you join our mailing list. And you can access all of these via the links available, uh, which will come out in, in the chat just now. In fact, there it is. So without further ado, uh, we shall hear from our speakers. Our first panelist tonight is uh, Robert Frost who is Bernard Fletcher Chair in History at the University of Aberdeen, post he's held since 2013. He has published on the early modern history of not only Poland Lithuania, but Ukraine, Sweden, and Russia, including studies of the Northern Wars, and volume one of the Oxford History of Poland Lithuania, uh, for which he won the Pro Historia Polonorum Award for the best work in Polish history by a foreign author. Uh, I believe that uh, volume two is currently in production um, but until, and we look forward to that, until then, we shall uh, hear from him in this 10 to 15 minute presentation. Over to you, Robert. Right, thank you very much, John. Um, let me just, first of all, share my screen. Because I've got 
a PowerPoint presentation for you, and I'm now going to minimize that. Right, it may seem a little odd that I begin a seminar introduction on Poland-Lithuania with a vision of a cavalryman, but the reason for this may become clear later on. Poland-Lithuania was not and never did become a naval power, yet it was intimately associated with the power struggle in the Baltic region and Northeastern Europe. Um, and I've called this little 15 minute talk, 10, 15 minute talk, fluid geopolitics, which I suppose is a bit of a pun given that we're talking about a sea. But the politics, the geopolitics of Eastern Europe is very, very fluid in history. And so I've got to show you some maps. Most of you will probably know that the history of Poland has shifted. It's, in, during its history, Poland has shifted its borders on many occasions. And this map just shows how frequently those shifts have taken place. The pink blob is modern day Poland in its current borders. Um, and the other outlines show how it has shifted across the word Poland in inverted commas. Um, Poles would sometimes present the map in this way, but Poland was a composite um, system of a composite polity, as John pointed out at the start, a union system of politics. So that's how it changed over time. Um, but I'm going to go far back to show that in the 14th century, under the reign of Casimir the Great in Poland, in the Kingdom of Poland, the main power on the Baltic littoral was the Teutonic Order and their remit, they'd relocated from the Holy Land and their remit was to combat the great pagans of Lithuania to the east. Lithuania was this vast land that had um, soaked up most of the lands of what had been Kievan Rus after the Mongol invasions. And a small pagan um, elite of Lithuanians, Lithuanian being a Baltic language, not a Slavic language, ruled over a large number, a much larger number of Ruthenians who were Orthodox in religion. And by the end of the 14th century, the Lithuanian system was coming under increasing pressure from the Livonian and from the Teutonic order, which was pushing east along the great rivers, and it needed Polish military help to assist it. Now, that was not the only reason for the Union, but in 1386, this Union was consummated, creating one of the largest polities, the largest polity in Europe. And that is the Polish-Lithuanian Union when it was first constituted. Um, if I can highlight it, down here is part of what is now Western, is Western Ukraine. Um, there is Kyiv. These are the Ruthenian lands, and Lithuania is up in the north here. And this was a great success, this union, in strategic terms. The Teutonic Knights were defeated heavily at the Battle of Grunwald, Tannenberg, Jalgiris in 1410. And the order was never the same after that. The Poles and Lithuanians united by consent and were able to argue that this was the way to convert the pagans. The Lithuanians converted to Roman Catholicism. Now, in the 15th century, the Prussian lands here um, revolted against what had become the oppressive rule of the Teutonic Knights, and Poland ended up in 1466 by incorporating in a union Royal Prussia, this area around Danzig, Torn, Torn down here, and Elbing. And throughout the 15th century, this great system dominated Eastern Europe. But by the 1490s, there were two new threats that were um, providing the military context to the shifting geopolitics. The first came from the south, from the Crimea, with the Crimean Tatar raids, which began really in the 1490s and penetrated deep into Kievan Rus, what had been Kievan Rus, into Muscovy, Russia, and into the Ukrainian lands of Poland, Lithuania. And in the 15th, to the end of the 15th century, Muscovy had united the rest of the, Rus, of the, the lands of Kievan Rus under its rule, and it began to lay claim to the lands of what had been Kievan Rus. 
Um, the rulers claimed to be rulers of all Rus, although they didn't ask the inhabitants of the rest of Rus that was now under Lithuanian rule whether they wanted to be members of this great Muscovite state. On the whole, they did not and resisted very successfully. But over the course of the late 15th and early 16th century, Lithuania lost a third of its lands to Muscovy. And that was the reason behind the Union of Lublin in 1569. Um, the Poles who, had, who were supporting Lithuania with money and with armies said, we will not go on supporting you unless we have a closer union. And Lithuanians resisted, but in 1569, a closer union was made and the southern lands, the Ruthenian lands, what is now mostly modern Ukraine, formed separate unions with Poland, with the Kingdom of Poland, and were removed from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And the rest of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania then formed a parliamentary union with Poland. And the other attraction was the liberties of the nobility. This was a noble union in which the nobility, some 8% of the population, had full political rights. And that was attractive to the lesser nobility in the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania. But this created certain strategic problems. The first being that the defensive capacity of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, this yellow bit, was seriously reduced. Um, and the southern lands were facing a greater threat from not just the Crimea, but from the Ottoman Turks by the early 17th century. And so it's a system that has to fight on two fronts. Firstly, in the north, in the Baltic, and secondly, in the south. And that determines a great deal of its geopolitics and its strategic problems. Now, this was a decentralized system in which the central parliament, the same, was formed by delegates, envoys, from 54 Samiks across the Commonwealth in this multinational, multi-ethnic, religiously divided um, polity. And that meant that politics was very slow in um, being in responding when military threats came. And in fact, the military system of the Commonwealth was very decentralized. Um, a lot of the uh, defense in the South was carried out by a small standing army, by the Ukrainian Cossacks, the Zaporozhian Cossacks down here to the south of Kyiv, and by a citizen army effectively, nobles who were raised and often paid by these local Samiks to respond when war threatened. And here I want to move on to the second part of my talk and state that while in geopolitical terms, Eastern Europe had been very, very fluid in terms of its borders. In strategic terms, um, the realities of fighting in Eastern Europe have not changed much across the centuries. And I've been interested to see how the current Russian invasion of Ukraine has borne out this idea. Let me go to um, Jan Hieronimovich Khodkevich, Hetman commander of Lithuania, who in um, the 16th century said, that the army should not, the Polish Lithuanian army should not sit dispersed on hilltops. They should be with the king, seeking to destroy the Muscovites at one blow. If the Lord grants us victory, all these chicken coops can be safely ignored. And that's a great problem in Eastern Europe. It is vast and um, it is very difficult. It is quite easy to send in an army, but it is very difficult to hold territory. And I looked at that 40 mile column of tanks that the Russians sent in and thought, I know what this is all about. The key to controlling a war was not to put little garrisons in nice angle bastion fortresses across Poland, Lithuania. They did have those fortresses in Danzig at the borders in the north and right down in the south at Khotin against the Turk. But the idea was to send out the army and to control the um, theater of war through cavalry. And that is why the Polish army, uniquely in Europe in the 16th and 17th century, had more cavalry than infantry. And to give a brief illustration of that, I will give the relief of Smolensk of 1634. In 1632, the king died, Sigismund III, who also claimed to be king of Sweden. Um, his son, Władysław IV, was elected Nemcon, 
but in 1632. But at that point, the Muscovites invaded to try and retake Smolensk, which the Poles and Lithuanians had taken back in um, 1611. It took 18 months for the same to organize relief. And a large Russian army sat camped outside Smolensk trying to take it. But once the army was together, the cavalry controlled the theater of war, surrounded the Russian camp and starved them out. And the commanders surrendered and were sent back to Moscow where they were executed for daring to surrender. Some things never change. The problem was that this political system began to suffer from its idea of consensus, the idea that all decisions should be taken, un not unanimously, but through a process of reaching consent. And in the 17th century, the geopolitics changed, and that's where Sweden came in. The Swedish, the son of the King of Sweden, Sigismund, was elected King of, uh, King of Poland in 1587. He was Catholic. He succeeded to the th Swedish throne in 1592 and was deposed in 1599. Sweden couldn't have a Catholic king. And that's when the long cycle of Swedish-Polish wars began. The idea of the union with Sweden was that Sweden and Poland-Lithuania could easily repulse any Moscovite attempt to take the Baltic shore. And they did, right down to the mid, right down to the early 18th century. But they then fell out. And in the 1650s, the crisis was reached when the Cossacks rebelled in Ukraine, the Muscovites invaded Lithuania, and the blue line shows as far as they reached by the August 1655. Then the Swedes came in, the whole system collapsed. But the decentralized system worked. It managed to repel the invaders eventually, with some help from the Austrians and the Prussians, the Brandenburgers, by 1667. But Kiev was lost to Russia, to Muscovy. And that's the point where Muscovy really became Russia. Finally, I'll end with the great change by the early 18th century, the Great Northern War. By that time, the Poles had elected a Saxon king, Augustus the Strong, who had ideas, grand strategic ideas, and he attacked the Swedish possessions in Livonia, along with um, Peter the Great, Peter the I of Russia, with whom he'd had a great drinking contest. They agreed to, to attack the Swedes with the, along with the Danes. Unfortunately, they came up against a military genius, Charles XII, who smashed the Danes and smashed the Russians and then came into Poland, Lithuania. The Poles and Lithuanians said, ah, but you're at war with the, with the Elector of Saxony. We are not at war with you. And the Swedes, Charles of Tell said, oh, yes, you are, and occupied Poland, Lithuania, set up a party, deposed the king, had an election. And that's the point at which the geopolitics changed, because Peter I realized that the way to gain influence in Poland and Lithuania was not to attack it, but was to manipulate its politics. He sent its, his army into Lithuania, where it fed itself, and he was able then to take at his leisure, the after the Battle of Poltava in 1709, the Swedish possessions in Livonia and Estonia. And he spent the rest of the 18th century upholding the liberties and rights of Polish-Lithuanian citizens that he refused to accord to his own subjects. But there I'm trespassing on Richard's territory, so I will halt there. I'm very happy to answer questions later on about naval aspects, should people wish. Many thanks, Robert. That's uh, an excellent way to start our panel off and uh, also provided a very good introduction of how, how the Commonwealth uh, looked uh, during, the, during its life. Um, so if you are able to stop uh, sharing uh, sorry, Oh yes, screen. sorry, the, 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 my camera's on top of the stop share button, so there we go. I see. <laughs> that should be it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I usually use MS Teams, which is a slightly different layout. So, so there we go. So I hope that's oh, well. <laughs> No, I mean, the maps are excellent, but uh, yes, um, they illustrate it well. I, I will move on now to our second speaker, who is Anna Kalinowska. Anna is a historian uh, working mainly on diplomatic and news history in Poland, Lithuania, and also in Western Europe during the late 16th and 17th century. 
Since 2006, she has been a member of the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and she has previously been the head of historical research at the Royal Castle in Warsaw, and is currently head of publications and digital resources at the Polish History Museum. Um, when you're ready, take it away, Anna. Thank you, Jen. Um, I will speak only about one aspect of uh, functioning of Polish-Lithuanian uh, Polish uh, commonwealth, but very important for uh, geopolitics, uh, and that will be diplomacy. And uh, I would argue that Polish-Lithuanian uh, Polish diplomacy of the 16th and the 17th century is an extremely interesting, but at the same time, very tricky issue. And one of the reasons for that is that as early as in the late 17th century, uh, it, Polish Lithuanian diplomacy was presented in a way that would focus mainly on its oddities. Polish diplomats were described as gaff prone, uh, extremely ostentatious, oozing exoticism. The Poles would also insist on using Latin, although by then French was the language of diplomacy. But most of all, Poland Lithuania would still rely solely on the system of ad hoc uh, missions, diplomatic missions, and would not establish uh, permanent diplomatic representations in other countries. And historians were similarly harsh in their assessments for decades for exactly uh, the same reasons. They considered Polish Lithuanian diplomacy to be unique and, and definitely not in a good way. Uh, but also peripheric and old fashioned, to quote just a few terms uh, they used to describe it. As well organized, efficient diplomacy has been one of the parameters of the modern statehood. Uh, this perception simply made the narrative about very weak, underdeveloped Polish Lithuanian state look as quite well grounded. I'm not going to question the fact that in the 17th century, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, was behind Western Europe in the process of uh, developing the efficient modern institutions so crucial for functioning of the state. Uh, but let us try to examine if it was really that simple when it comes to diplomacy and diplomatic service. Was Polish Lithuanian diplomacy truly a backward looking and what were the reasons of its problems? So for the next few, a few minutes, I would like to talk about three issues. Uh, first, the legal, institution, the legal situation of uh, diplomacy and foreign policy in the late 16th and the 17th century, uh, Poland Lithuania. Then about the attitudes toward the permanent diplomatic representation. And finally, the reasons behind some of the changes that did occur over the 17th uh, century. Uh, diplomacy is based on uh, execution of use legationum, the right to send and to receive diplomatic representatives. There are different legal schools and theories, but basically that right would be part of the royal or sovereign prerogative. In case of Poland Lithuania, it was divided between the king and the commonwealth on very different levels. Union of Lublin in uh, 15. 69 indicated that all international agreements and negotiations should be conducted and diplomats negotiating important issues sent abroad only if both nations, which was the Grand Duchy and the Crown, so Poland, had been consulted and both agreed. Additionally, neither Grand Duchy of Lithuania or the Crown were allowed to undertake any diplomatic activities uh, that would be potentially harmful to the other party. Then uh, the Henrician Articles, another extremely important document developed in 1573 during the first royal election, restricted royal prerogatives in an even stricter way. The king was allowed to send the diplomats in matters unrelated to the Commonwealth, provided he had consulted uh, the business with the senators. To send or receive any other diplomatic missions, he needed to seek Senate's con consent and to respect Sejm's parliament, uh, so parliament's position. That might be um, interpreted uh, that for sending any diplomatic mission related to the Commonwealth's business, uh, he was uh, that any any diplomatic mission related to the Commonwealth's business 
would be in fact, uh, and was in fact, to represent the king and the senate or same. Then every newly elected king would have to accept the so-called pacta conventa, an individual contract, so to say, and between him and, and his new subjects. And quite often diplomacy was included, uh, included in these documents. The issues uh, mentioned uh, reflected current situation. For example, when monarchs tried to be more independent in their foreign policy, their successors would definitely be forced to confirm that uh, they were going to consult all their decisions or follow stricter rules. This is very obvious, obvious, especially in the case of the second half of the 17th century. The problem is that all these regulations were rather vague. One may ask, for example, what is a diplomatic mission unrelated to the Commonwealth's business if it is sent on behalf and by the king of the state? The role of the Senate and the same was also changing. Uh, both uh, houses were supposed to control the king and diplomacy since the very beginning, but in practice, in the earlier periods, there would not prevent the monarch from, from initiating and supervising diplomatic activities. Uh, they did try to execute their role more vigorously and, in fact, to block the king uh, from uh, the late, from the mid um, 17th century. And it was clearly a consequence of actions uh, taken by, undertaken by the Vaza monarchs who conducted quite independent foreign policy aimed at confirming their rights to the Swedish throne and reclaiming it. Another crucial moment was Jan Sobieski's reign and his uh, secret dealings with France and treaty with Sweden in 1677 linked to his plan to take over control over the Duke of Prussia. So issues linked to the Baltic region had direct ramifications for the way diplomacy was treated as uh, the part of internal situation and the way diplomacy was used in the conflict between the king and his people. Let's move to the lack of uh, permanent, uh, uh, permanent uh, representation, the most common argument used to present the weaknesses of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth diplomacy. First of all, the perspective has changed recently and historians uh, seem to be more understanding. We talk now about asymmetric relations, the system uh, that was in fact applied by a number of countries that uh, operated on ad hoc missions. In other words, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was not the only state that did not build a network of embassies all over Europe. What is important here is to look at the list of those countries. We have Muscovy, we have Turkey, but also Scotland, Portugal, Denmark, and Sweden. As you can see, these are all rather specific cases that cannot be identified as being in the main trend of developments of early modern diplomacy. But what is important here is whether the system was efficient enough when it comes to the state's needs. Every single diplomatic player has serious various has, has had and have uh, has various partners, some of greater importance and some only occasional. So uh, its diplomatic presence might and should be adjusted to the current situation, especially as for some countries, it was possible to use different tools, such as, for example, cooperation with the trade uh, companies, etc. Secondly, it is now clear that Schlachta, who was sending the representatives to same was not as hostile to the institution of a permanent diplomatic representation as it was uh, so far believed. They did argue strongly against presence of foreign uh, embassies, but basically accepted the fact that at some point, Polish-Lithuanian permanent missions abroad had been established. This evolved from uh, the royal uh, unofficial diplomatic residence that the Vazas started, started to send to Vienna, Madrid, the United Provinces and Denmark uh, in the 20s and in the um, uh, 30s. Schlachter opposed those uh, residents sometimes very vocally, but at the same time uh, was very much aware of the benefits they could provide. 
So we deal with a situation when there uh, were some voices that keeping residents at foreign courts was just a huge waste of money and abuse of Polish uh, tradition. And this, this argument was extremely popular and, and very catchy still also with, with the historians. On the other hand, in uh, 1662, the same introduced the bill where uh, Nicolas de B, a long-term royal diplomatic residence in The Hague, uh, was referred to as the late king's and our residence uh, uh, in the United Provinces. This is just one of uh, many cases uh, proving that Schlachter de facto accepted the idea of using modern diplomatic tools. So basic, basically, there was acceptance for the concept of having a network of uh, permanent diplomatic representat represent uh, representatives, but the problem was how the whole thing should be done and by whom. And this brings us to another issue of the way the Polish-Lithuanian diplomacy, uh, of, of why the Polish-Lithuanian diplomacy uh, was uh, uh, never was able to become part of the main European trend. Uh, there are numerous reasons, some already described, uh, for example, the complicated legal situation. Another, probably the most important in the context of the fact that there was acceptance for the institution of a residence and abroad, was growing mistrust and also and uh, uh, declining respect for the monarch. This is a combination of political interest and current, politi current politics and decline of political culture. In the 1620s, when Sigismund III tried to act on his own, same would be annoyed, opposed, uh, would oppose uh, um, King's actions, but would uh, not act in any drastic way. As um, the members of the parliament and Schlachter in general would uh, understand that it was not the way to secure fuller control of King's actions regarding uh, his international activity. Under Władysław IV, Sigismund's son, who was extremely active on the European diplomatic stage, the Senate, uh, for example, made use of the vagueness of the legal regulations and tried to counteract King's actions. This was very confusing for the foreign courts as they and their diplomats were not able to follow fully uh, the situation, but still, the king enjoyed enough freedom to pursue his diploma diplomatic agenda. Three or four decades later, there was no restraint. When Schlachter was suspicious of the foreign diplomats, they simply decided to expel them all, all from uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, uh, co Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth territory. So uh, practically, and so practically to bar them from uh, conducting their duties. That uh, in turn made the king to try to figure out how the ban could have been circumvented. And Sobieski was uh, sometimes very creative uh, in this field. One needs also to remember about another problem. While Western states established support system for their diplomacy and diplomatic service, that is developed ways to finance its activities, uh, the develop different procedures, the way to recruit uh, personnel and introduce professional courses honorum for diplomats. In Poland, Lithuania, it were issues that were dealt with uh, on an ad hoc basis or simply left with no control. System of preserving, and the, interesting, the, the, the very interesting case is the system of preserving diplomatic documentation. Uh, it was inherited from the Jagiellonian period, but it worked rather poorly. The chancellors and vice chancellors were in charge of documentation, but they often, uh, and these were more or less the equivalents of, of uh, the, 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 this, these offices were more or less the equivalents of the English uh, secretaries of state. So they were in charge of the documentation, but they often treated this docu the, the documentation as their own working materials and not state documents. Hence, nothing like state papers in England or diplomatic archives in other countries really exists now. In Libri Legationum, the collection that was supposed to be 
uh, something like this. The general, the, the, the French uh, diplomatic archive of Poland, Lithuania, definitely cannot be described as such. To sum up, all these factors were responsible for the bad PR of Polish-Lithuanian diplomacy in early modern period, but also later. But, uh, but as I tried to show, the problem is more complex. It is not just that Poland-Lithuania was allergic to modern diplomacy in any form. So it seems reasonable that we should revisit this issue because without, full, without fuller understanding of how and why the system worked or did not work, uh, we cannot really analyze the geopolitical consequences of the whole situation in this period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was an extremely interesting talk. And I think really got to the sort of uh, the matter of kind of uh, Poland Lithuania's um, construct and, and how and how it kind of functioned uh, in, in a reasonably unique way. So thank you very much. Um, so we'll move now to our final speech, uh, speaker, who is Richard Butwick Pawlikowski. Uh, Richard is a professor in Polish Lithuanian history at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London. His re research focuses on the 18th century Commonwealth, as uh, well as Enlightenment thinking in Europe. His latest monographs, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth 1733 1795, Light and Flame, published in 2020, and 2021, the Constitution on 3rd of May 1791, Testament of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, handle the last years of the Commonwealth and the lead up to its partition. He has been a visiting scholar at the College of Europe uh, in Natalin, and as of this year has worked as the Polish History Museum's principal historian. Uh, Richard um, will be very interested to hear what you say tonight. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, John. Dobry wieczór, dobry wieczór, lavas vakas. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk about the geopolitics of the partitions of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, 1772, 1793, 1795. It's hard to forget those dates. Now, the partitions can, and for and indeed for a long time, have been considered in terms of a moral lesson. One of the most popular ones has been that the sin of anarchy will be punished and that the vices of the anarchic, oppressive, superstitious, backward Polish-Lithuanian nobility, the Schlachta, were punished by the partitions. Now, understandably, that's been an explanation beloved of the uh, monarchies that partitioned the Commonwealth at the end of the 18th century uh, and their official historians going through the 19th and indeed 20th and into the 21st century in the case of neo-imperial Russia. But it's also been a view that has been held for various domestic political reasons uh, by a great number of Poles, including Roman Domowski and Józef Józewski. Alternatively, we can see there being an immoral lesson here of evil empires conspiring against liberty uh, and dust in a dastardly fashion, partitioning their neighbor. Now, that's actually quite important because I don't think we should confuse the question of who here is the victim and who here is the aggressor. But nevertheless, it's fairly inadequate uh, as an explanation for a, a complex historical process. I won't pretend I'm sort of neutral on this one. We can also see this as part of the geopolitical expansion of the Russian Empire in the 18th century. Uh, it's important to note that between 1699, the Treaty of Karlovitz, and the first partition of the Commonwealth in 1772, uh, there were no significant territorial losses. Uh, and the Frontiers have varied greatly in the course of the 17th century, but from 1699 to 1772, they are stable. Now, there are two 
directions of Russian imperial expansion. One is to the northwest towards the Baltic, which leads to conflicts with the Swedish Empire above all. And the other is to the south, bringing Russia into conflicts with the Crimean Khanate, uh, and in particular, by the time we get to the 18th century with the uh, Ottoman Empire. And this is expansion that takes place uh, in the central and southern and eastern lands of Ukraine in its current borders, including, of course, the Crimea, which was annexed by Russia in 1783, having been declared independent of the Ottoman Empire uh, in 17. 74. And these two theatres are linked, but they're linked not only by Russia, but they are linked by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is in between. And so Poland-Lithuania usually plays a role in both Russia's expansion northwest and Russia's expansion to the south. They interact. Now, we can also construct a kind of model of the European powers after the Seven Years' War, that is after 1763, as a pentarchy. In the West, we have the two maritime empires uh, of Great Britain and France. Great Britain has just scored a great victory over the French, albeit at great expense. And the effect of this is to draw France away uh, from much of its interest uh, and ability to respond uh, further east in the European continent so that we get a shift in the geopolitical center of gravity to the center and the east of Europe. And in the center east, we have another hostile relationship between Prussia and the Habsburg monarchy, which is in the diplomatic parlance of the time referred to as Austria or the Austrian monarchy. Now, because of the systemic hostility between Austria and Prussia, particularly over the Prussian conquest of Silesia, uh, which is now, of course, the southwest corner of Poland, uh, which the Austrians very much wish to reverse, but were never able to, now, this creates an opportunity for the easternmost great power uh, to play off the Austrians and the Russians against each other, and this, of course, is the Russian Empire. Into this model of European geopolitics, we can also mention several secondary powers, which can be sort of useful allies, even if they're not going to be able to take on one of the great powers by themselves uh, with a hope of overall victory. And this is Spain in the West, which has become an ally of France. We have the Netherlands you know, in the center uh, West, usually an ally of Great Britain. Then we have Sweden, which has been greatly weakened after the Great Northern War, and which for the next 50 years uh, is in its so-called age of liberty. It's not quite as uh, sort of um, emaciated as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but nevertheless, it's contested between France and Russia for influence, but Sweden still has its potential, as we shall see. And then, of course, in the southeast, there is the Ottoman Empire, perhaps the greatest of all the, the second rank powers. And we can also talk about some vacuums of power, which draw in the greater and indeed the secondary powers. Uh, and one could be found you know, in the south, in the Italian peninsula, Another one would be in the center in the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, except, of course, for those parts of the Holy Roman Empire, which were part of the Prussian monarchy or the Austrian monarchy. And then in the east, we have the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is therefore surrounded with the three great powers of the east, Russia to the east, Prussia to the northwest, Austria to the southwest. And we shouldn't forget, of course, the Ottoman Empire uh, to the southeast. So that's a kind of sketch. Now, speaking of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as a kind of geopolitical vacuum in the 18th century rather sort of encourages the idea that it had simply fallen into an anarchic paralysis, that it had nothing of its own to contribute uh, by the time we get to the sort of the, the middle third uh, of the 18th century. And in perhaps you know, strictly fiscal, military, political terms, that may be the case, although 
greatly underestimates uh, the amount of economic and social development, as well as the cultural and intellectual uh, developments that are beginning uh, by that time. Now, it then raises the, the question of what happens when the Commonwealth starts to try to assert itself, or even when crises in the Commonwealth draw in uh, the other powers, especially Russia. At what point does the Commonwealth start to threaten uh, the interests of those other powers and what are the consequences uh, going to be? We have a series of reactions and counter reactions. The kind of unofficial, rather low key Russian protectorate that had been exercised over the Commonwealth from the end of the Great Northern War in 1721. Um, with the, the violent exception, of course, of the intervention in the Polish royal election of 1733, there was no question of the Russians allowing the father-in-law of the King of France uh, to become uh, King of Poland. With that exception, this is a fairly low-key level of a protectorate. It's more about preventing things from happening than making things happen. And that changes in the 1760s when the Empress Catherine II, in need of a foreign policy success to shore up her position, decides to sort of uh, fix the next Polish uh, Lithuanian election and also to present herself to an orthodox constituency at home and to an enlightened philosophical constituency uh, in, in France as the avenging angel. Uh, of religious tolerance. And this creates a series of violent uh, reactions within a much more active, in intellectual terms, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that leads to this revolt against reform, against uh, re uh, religious equality, against Russian intervention too, known as the Confederacy of Bar. And that in turn helps to spark a Russo-Ottoman war begins in 1768, goes on to 1774, ends in a great Russian victory, but it, you know, not all of it is easy going uh, for uh, the Russian Empire. And we can explain the, uh, the first partition as an accumulation of different factors. Uh, some of which are to do with the difficulty in Russian control of the Commonwealth. It's not just that they had a guerrilla war with the Confederates on their hand. They'd also been disappointed in the king, uh, Stanislav August Poniatowski uh, and his uncles. Now, for a moment, I'm going to share the screen to show you the effects of the first partition. And then I'll take it back down again. There you can see the first partition. You can see that the Russians have taken a large slice in the northeast, which has smoothed their access along the river Divina or Daugava uh, to uh, the Baltic, and at the same time made it harder for peasants to escape from the Russian Empire into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, into the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Then in the south, the Austrians have taken almost as much with twice as many people, but this is on the other side of the Carpathians, it's fairly indefensible. And then the Prussians, they don't get the great city of Danzig or Gdansk or Antorn uh, or Torun, uh, and they get the smallest amount of territory and the smallest population, but it is strategically vital because it links up the two parts uh, of the Hohenzollern monarchy. Now, this is sometimes presented as a Russian reverse because they'd had control of the whole and now they have a smaller area. Uh, but on the other hand, we must remember that it was Catherine II who made the decision. She made the decision at the moment of her greatest triumphs against the Ottoman Empire, uh, and she was in a position to achieve some Russian strategic goals, and that the control she achieved of the remainder of the Commonwealth uh, was uh, considerably greater uh, than in the unstable situation during the uh, Confederacy of Bar. Uh, and the systemic Prusso-Austrian hostility had not gone away, as was revealed by the outbreak of a further Prusso-Austrian war in 1778. Uh, now, in this Commonwealth, after the first partition, uh, we have what's called the proconsulate, in a reference to the system of, uh, uh, of control of ancient Rome with regard to its uh, client uh, kingdoms. But within this overall freeze on the ability of the Commonwealth to put through major fiscal, military, institutional reforms, an awful lot can happen in terms of social and economic developments and cultural and intellectual developments and ferment begins to, uh, to build up. And there is the potential here uh, for uh, the next stage. 
Now, to understand what happens, we need to go back to about 1780. Uh, and the Russian Empire has been disappointed with its alliance with Prussia, which has not been very helpful in helping it to expand against the Ottoman Empire. And there's a realization that Austria will be able to help against the Ottoman Empire, but on the other side, it could also cause a problem uh, for expansion against the Ottoman Empire. So we get the switch of the Russian alliance uh, from Prussia to Austria uh, in 1781. And this makes it possible for the Russians to complete uh, their annexation of the Crimea. But it also has the effect of driving Prussia closer to Great Britain. And there have been some very bad relations at the end of the, the Seven Years' War there. Uh, and also the Prussian intervention in the Netherlands in 1787 uh, leads to the effective Anglo-Prussian alliance sealing in the Netherlands to, uh, to that block, much to the frustration of the French, although they'd beaten the British in North America, that it bankrupted them, they were unable to do anything about the Prussian intervention in the Netherlands. The Empress of Russia was therefore on the opposite side uh, to the Prussia, and cautious old Frederick the Great had died in 1786, and his ambitious, uh, you know, much criticized nephew, uh, Frederick William II was out to prove himself to show that he could go better than his misanthropic, sardonic old uncle. So this creates the situation for a very different kind of diplomatic and geopolitical uh, conjuncture. Now, when a new round of the Russo-Ottoman conflict breaks out in 1787, there is a question of how will the Commonwealth respond? The king wants to join in on the Russian side and make Poland-Lithuania more important that way. But there are others who begin to look towards Berlin instead as the opportunity to, you know, to try and see what can be achieved as opposed to just sticking uh, with Russia. And when the king of Prussia uh, as a representative you know, blunders in to uh, promising rather more than the king intended, uh, at the start of the Polish-Lithuanian Parliament of 1788, all hell breaks loose, uh, and the very clever Italian diplomat uh, Girolamo Lucchesini is then able to widen the breach, so that by the end of 1788, Prussian influence has more or less replaced Russian and Polish-Lithuanian politicians begin to believe that anything is possible. It's possible to throw off the yoke of the Russian protectorate. Another factor here is that in the summer of 1788, the King of Sweden, Gustavus III, uh, the who back in 1772 had taken advantage of the Russo-Ottoman War to sort of throw off the shackles of the Age of Liberty, strengthen the monarchy, uh, and distance himself from the Russians, has taken the opportunity to attack the Russians, and he rattles the windows in St. Petersburg uh, with his artillery. So the Russians have no choice. They have to concentrate in their war against the Ottoman Turks, the Austrians at least are on their side, and they are unable to prevent the Polish-Lithuanian parliament expressing the sovereignty of this national community, which has undergone a cultural and intellectual transformation, uh, and, and which then transforms itself even faster over the next four years in what's known as the four years same or parliament, the great same, or I call it the Polish revolution, uh, following the usage uh, of many uh, contemporary observers. And by the year that follows, the 3rd of May, 1791 constitution, the potential of the Commonwealth is becoming fully apparent. Above all, there is a great danger felt in the courts of St. Petersburg, Berlin, and Vienna that you're gonna get mass migration into the Commonwealth. Uh, burgers, you know, away from high regulation, high tax uh, environments in Prussia and Austria into low tax, low regulation, politically free environments in the Commonwealth, serfs, particularly from the Russian Empire, but also from Prussia and Austria, given your a greater chance of being conscripted uh, into uh, the army. So there's a demographic threat there. There's an ideological threat there. Uh, because if you can show uh, that it's possible to have orderly freedom, it's not just this disruptive, disorderly kind of freedom, but, a, but an orderly version. Well, you know, if they're getting closer to the, you know, to the constitution of Great Britain, which everyone seems to think, you know, works so wonderfully in the, in, in the 18th century, but this is a real ideological threat. 
uh, from the perspective uh, of three absolutist uh, monarchies. I don't say that they were absolute, but they were certainly aspiringly uh, absolute, therefore uh, absolutist. And then there is the geopolitical problem. The Commonwealth with its resources, 10 million people, vast amount of land, potential part of a coalition. That is a real danger, uh, particularly from the point of view of St. Petersburg, where a great deal of pressure has already been put on. Uh, on a previous occasion, I believe I spoke in greater length about the Ochakov crisis, uh, so I sort of won't do uh, so at sort of this time. But this is a moment when it really does look as though the British government is going to send a fleet to the Baltic. The Prussian uh, army is going to move into sort of Russian uh, Livonia. Uh, and at the same time, the Turkish war uh, is still ongoing, even if Catherine has managed to settle the Swedish war with an honourable draw after the Swedes have given uh, themselves a good account uh, of themselves. Now, it doesn't happen. One of the main reasons for that is we get a very effective hybrid and media war fought by the Russian embassy, uh, corrupting MPs, uh, buying up merchants, organizing public meetings. No war with Russia for the sake of a fortress on the shores of the Black Sea. Doesn't that all sound familiar? Uh, ultimately, though, by the spring of 1791, it's clear it's not going to happen. Within a few months, Russia is going to be able to deal with the Commonwealth. And there's absolutely no question of Catherine tolerating a Commonwealth that is strong enough to threaten her. It's either going to be a much smaller Commonwealth or a much weaker Commonwealth, probably both. Uh, so we get the Russian invasion of the Commonwealth in 1792. And it's at this point that the Polish-Lithuanian situation uh, sort of uh, moves into uh, a, um, it interacts with the situation with the French Revolutionary Wars. Uh, Catherine is very much ideologically opposed to the uh, to the uh, to the French Revolution, of course, but she really wants to get this is the 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 Prussians and the Austrians to do that fighting rather than herself, so that she can deal with this ideological revolutionary threat uh, much closer to home in Poland on her terms. So when it comes to the second partition of 1793, you can see that Austria doesn't take part. Austria is told, go and conquer some lands from the French. Uh, uh, this means that the Russians aren't going to have to share some strategically vital area in the southeast, particularly the fortress of Kamieniec Podolski, uh, Podolski uh, in Polish, uh, with the Austrians. They can be sort of kept where they are. And Russia can help itself to an absolutely enormous stretch of land, more or less in a straight line. Uh, not too far away from the border of Poland in the interwar period, uh, incidentally, although the salient in the Pripyat marshes uh, goes the other way for some reverse military uh, reasons. And the Prussians get four times less territory and three times less people, even if these are wealthy areas and these very nicely round out uh, the Kingdom of Prussia. So this is a bargain that's very much in the Russian interest, the strategic and economic value of these lands, uh, which have been economically the most dynamic part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, particularly in the far southeast. Uh, and this means that the strategic value is there because of the communication during the Russo-Ottoman War. Now, the end game is you know, fairly simple to explain. This is an intolerable situation for the citizens of the Commonwealth, urban and landed, uh, who have had their hopes raised so high and then dashed so low. We get the insurrection of 1794, which is a bit more radical uh, in its revolutionary uh, uh, ideology than that in the, of the Polish Revolution of 1788 to 92. Uh, this, of course, then is crushed by Russia, even if the Prussians make a, uh, an embarrassment of themselves, uh, and Russia will then divide up the remaining lands, again, to play off the Austrians and the Prussians against each other to suit itself. So to sum up, I would say that this can be explained in terms of Russian imperial, geopolitical, but also ideological expansion, partly through uh, demographic fears, uh, because ultimately the Commonwealth was a potential threat that could have shut out the Russian empire from that sort of push 
westwards into European politics, and that threat had to be eliminated. And Russia, in the event, were very happy to ditch its alliance with the Commonwealth in order to get a generous share for itself. And the Austrians were just left with the alternative, well, you either join in and get a bit for yourselves or you get nothing at all, so no choice at all. So that's my geopolitical take on the partitions of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. That was uh, fantastic, and um, you illustrated very well the, the the broader motivations for this kind of huge rubbing out of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And and you're right, uh, the phrase "Russian hybrid war" does seem very familiar at the moment. Um, so thank you. Um, so we open now to audience questions. Please. Um, uh, keep on sending them into us. Um, be very interested to hear different perspectives and different queries and different comments. Um, for now, I will uh, ask uh, a question to each of you, if I may. Um, so, so Robert, you you mentioned that uh, you were welcome to questions on the maritime uh, situation. So I will oblige. Um, so I, I gather really that the the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth had initially had very uh, small plans for a naval force, but it didn't really come off. Um, how um, how did it change the sort of strategic situation? The fact that the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth didn't have a, a, a naval presence, and how feasible could it really? have been given the uh, sort of difficulties in raising enough money for a land army and was there any sort of way in which um uh pressure sort of influence could be put on great sort of maritime ports such as Danzig and, and elbing to kind of help with the situation um i'll ask all my questions all at once uh just um so anna um I, I felt it's interesting uh, thinking about the kind of unique way that the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth is, is structured. And I wondered if um, the fact that nobles had so much leverage over the, the king in, in this situation, whether that affected the sort of the way in which Commonwealth um, representative in, interacted with other, um, other rulers and um whether they had greater expectations for how they were how they were treated um and for for richard um so I, i'm thinking that obviously in the, the following century 19th century with the revolts and, and such uh it, it kind of shows that the partitions were kind of a very large but spicy mouthful to swallow um how um how in the sort of early years of the partitions did these more absolutist powers try and manage uh these vast ways of territory with uh with nobles who had come to expect um such leverage in the political system um so i'll i'll come to robert first if that's great right. right yes i mean the whole question of Poland Lithuania's attempt to be, attempts, usually by the crown, to become a naval power is, is a very interesting and quite complex matter. The one period where it did operate quite effectively as at, at sea, or really rather the round the mouth of the Vistula, was in the 15th century during the war with the Royal Prussia, with the, the Teutonic Order. The Thirteen Years' War, when with Danzig, Torn, and Elbing wanting to fight the Teutonic Order and defeat it, they used um, really privateer fleets on the Vistula and out into the Baltic to um, meet and defeat the, um, the Teutonic Order. Later on, once Royal Prussia had become part of the Kingdom of Poland and into the 16th century, that's when the Baltic trade really grows to immense proportions from the late 16th century, from the mid 16th century, really down to 
around the 1620s. And Danzig then becomes, Danzig in particular, but the great cities of royal Prussia do not desire to have a um, Polish government fleet operating in the Baltic. They make their wealth out of trade. They do not want their trade to be taxed. The Danes tax all the ships at the mouth of the Baltic at the Sound, or the King of Denmark does. And Danzig fears that if the crown gains a proper fleet, then it will start wanting to tax fleets for itself. And Danzig at this point feels pretty secure. It's built itself a marvelous rain, uh, sort of super modern set of fortifications. It has its own militia that can resist attacks. And after 1577, when it has a brief spat with Stefan Batori, the king, um, it's all sorted out. And attempts by Sigismund August in the 1550s and 1560s, and then Sigismund III, who has deposed from the Swedish throne, wants to get his Swedish throne back. He tries, he sets up a, a naval commission and tries to build a fleet. He does actually get a fleet, and I joke with my Swedish um, colleagues that Poland has a 100% record as a naval power because it only fought one one major sea battle at a lever in 1628, and it beat the Swedes with a bit of help from Scots, it has to be said. Um, but that was the only occasion, and he couldn't, he didn't have the funds because they didn't, you know, Danzig wouldn't, and Royal Prussia wouldn't pay money to sustain a fleet, and therefore he had to basically send his fleet to Wallenstein. Um, which he does in the late 1620s, um, part of the Spanish naval um, plan to defeat the Dutch by hitting them from Wismar um, and that's affecting the Baltic trade. But, you know, he, Poland never requires a navy. And that's why the land war means so much. And I think the major shift strategically in geopolitics is when Peter decides that Russia is going to become a naval power. Um, you know, a lot of the narrative about Muscovy's drive to the West and desire for Baltic ports. Yes, Ivan the Terrible is interested in Livonia and Estonia, but that's not his real concern. His real concern is to grab all Rus from Lithuania. And that's where he drew, he sends most of his forces in those wars. And Peter says, it's the Baltic that's key. It's the trade. It's controlling these ports. And I will build a navy. And that is a major strategic turning point. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Anna. Uh, uh, may, maybe I will start with uh, adding that uh, actually it wasn't just one uh, military uh, success. Uh, we oh, I, was, all, I was joking. We are, we are, I know, I know, but uh, uh, we are also responsible for what happened to uh, Vaza uh, in Stockholm when it was launched. So. Um, and seriously, uh, and seriously, uh, when it comes to when it comes to this uh, leverage uh, or this very unique position of of uh, Polish nobility of Polish Schlachter, when it comes to well formation of Pol of of um, foreign policy, but also basically conducting uh, foreign policy through. Uh, the means of uh, diplomacy and diplomatic uh, diplomatic service. Um, it was definitely confusing because I can I can give you several ex examples at least based only on on British uh, on British um, experience because what the material I'm I'm most familiar with is is uh, British. Uh, it's what is left by the British diplomats. And since the very beginning, since the late 17th, since the late, late 16th century, they, they are genuinely surprised what's going on. The ambassador comes to comes to the Polish court to deal with uh, to deal with uh, commercial issues, because at that point, this was the main factor uh, for uh, for the English diplomacy. And, and he is quite surprised because the king, the king invited him to for, for the meeting with the Council of Senate. He wouldn't expect it. What he wanted he, was to talk to the to talk to the king, to talk to the chancellor, to have uh, to, to get what he needed and go back to, to London. 
And then he is told that, well, now the, the special commission, commission will be the special, the special committee will be named by the senators. And in two or three months, we will, uh, we will uh, tell you what our decision, what our decision is. So, so at the beginning, it was really surprising, really confusing, quite, quite quickly. Um, at least the diplomats in the from the countries that were visiting Poland that on, on, on regular basis. So, so basically uh, Habsburg diplomats and, um, and um, Swedish diplomats at some point at the beginning, they knew that the most important thing was to be present during the parliamentary session. So there are also examples of, of foreign diplomats racing to Warsaw to be the uh, to, 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 be at, uh, to be at the royal court, but also to be there during the, during the parliament. So they, so, because that would give them uh, better, uh, better chances for, uh, for um, getting what they wanted. And it was partly because the kings, the monarchs, also tried to take advantage, to, 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 to take advantage of, of the whole situation. So even though they were very much restricted in what were they were officially allowed to do when it comes to interactions with, with foreign diplomats, uh, very often they use those restrictions as excuse not to do something that the foreign diplomats wanted them to do. So another, another English, English example, um, uh, when uh, Sigismund I went to Sweden, and he went there twice after the death of his father, John III. So, so basically the posts were not thrilled that the king was going to Sweden, that's for sure. And, and they introduced some extra restrictions and some dealt with, with uh, diplomacy. So ba basically, but th this restriction was more about foreign diplomats coming to Poland during the king's absence. They didn't really want to have foreign diplomats coming to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth because they would have to wait for the king, that would be a nuisance. Uh, but at the same time, when Sigismund went to Stockholm in, um, in, uh, in 1598, uh, English ambassador came, Sir George, actually he was, oh yes, he was English, not the Scottish. I, there's so many Scots in, in, in uh, English, and well, in, in British diplomatic service post 1603. That, uh, uh, but he was he was definitely English. Sir so, uh, George Carew, he came to Poland. He was told that the king had just left, so he followed. Uh, so he had he followed uh, Sigismund to Stockholm, and the king said, "Well, I'm very happy to see you, but you know the problem is I'm not in Poland. I can't talk to you about what you want me to talk to you about because uh, I'm not allowed to do it when I'm not in uh, on, on the territory of, of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth." And there are numerous, numerous examples of, of, of situations um, like this on very different, on very different levels. So, and definitely different diplomats from different countries had very different experiences, of course. Uh, but in general, it was confusing and, and it took some time for, for other countries to figure out how the system worked. Thank you very much for that answer. I'll come to Richard then. Yes, thank you for the, the question. In the initial period, it seems that the strategy of all three of the partitioning monarchies was to try and co-opt at least the wealthier nobles uh, into the um, the elites of their uh, monarchies, so that uh, those who had reasonable amounts of land, that could do those who could document their, their nobility, they would receive title, status, tax exemptions, in some cases, in the Russian case at least, greater powers over their, uh, of their insert peasants. Um, and in was you could probably say in that sort of first generation or so, it, this strategy is most effective in the Russian empire, uh, because the Russian Empire lacks the 
bureaucratic capacity to uh, enforce uh, obedience to the state in the same way that the two German monarchies uh, could do, which therefore possible for Polish, Lithuanian, Ruthenian nobles to, uh, to make careers in the military and in, in the bureaucracy. There's a good deal of self-government. There is an extraordinary educational achievement of the, of the Vilna, uh, Vilna school district, uh, which means that by the end of Alexander the First reign, uh, there are actually more people in the Russian Empire that can read and write in Polish uh, that can read and write in Russian because of the much larger size of the Polish-Lithuanian nobility. And therefore, uh, if most of them were being sort of sent to decent schools, then uh, that's going to mean a vast proportion of the literate people of the empire uh, would actually have been enjoying the heritage of the Commission of National Education, uh, first founded back in 17. Uh, 73. In the case of Prussia, uh, there's an economic boom to start with. In fact, it leads to a lot of uh, Polish nobles getting into debt. Uh, in Austria was the toughest. Um, the greatest increases in taxes, greatest restrictions on what they could do uh, regarding the, uh, the peasants. And it was Austria that bore the absolute brunt of the war against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. So although there were certain gains for the peasants, I mean, you know, tens of thousands of uh, peasants were conscripted into the Austrian army and not all of them returned home with two legs and two arms and two eyes uh, and two ears. Um, and so there were sort of winners and losers from that. And into that, we get a French alternative. Initially, we don't get much uh, take up for those who radically reject what the partitioning powers have to offer and, in, and go to conspiracies, armed insurrections, hopes that the French will come along. But that all changes when Napoleon Bonaparte uh, beats uh, the, uh, the Prussians, beats the Austrians, uh, and establishes the, the Duchy of Warsaw, which he then expands in 1809. And to the extent that there is a rational case in 1812, and even after 1812, to say that actually Napoleon is offering rather more than uh, the, uh, the, the Tsar is, um, is offering. Then 1815, Alexander, rather impressed by the way in which these uh, the Polish forces are fought against him, and he rather generously establishes a, a little kingdom of Poland, which is rather liberal on paper, even if in practice things work out very madly. It's really after sort of 1830, the failure of the rising uh, uh, of disappointed Poles against uh, uh, Russia, which by this time is ruled by the autocratic uh, and inflexible Nicholas I, uh, that uh, it becomes, you know, everything is a bad option uh, sort of situation. And that isn't recompensed uh, from the 1860s onwards when uh, things get rather more liberal in the Habsburg monarchy, uh, because that's at that point that they get far greater pressure to Russify and to Germanize uh, on the part of the other two partitioning powers. So in the end, who gains, who losses, you could make a case that the two German powers brought Russia to its knees in the First World War, so therefore the partitions must have weakened Russia. Or on the other hand, you could probably say that you know, the partitions gave the opportunity to, uh, to Russia to, uh, uh, to continue to play the two German powers off against each other. Uh, or you could say that it actually brought them all three together and gave them a common interest in keeping the Poles down. Thanks very much for that answer, Richard. Um, I'm going to go to the Q&A now, where we have a question from Darius Liss, uh, which I will leave open for um, whoever wants to comment. Um, so Darius asks, uh, can you comment please on the economic uh, backwardness of the Rzeczpospolita Commonwealth in 16th and 17th centuries? Um, so I, I'll go to Robert first. Robert indeed has his hand up, so I will definitely go to Robert first. <laughs> yeah, so I saw that question in the Q&A, so I, I, I've had a few thoughts about it. Um, I would ask, what do you mean by backward? Um, and one of the problems of looking at Poland-Lithuania is that it's judged for not being an apple when it's actually a banana. Um, you know, what do we mean by backward? Usually historians mean by being backward is that you're not Britain or France. And yet Britain is a very small island 
in which not very many places are more than 50 miles from the sea, in which there's a river network and water transport is very effective. Poland and Lithuania is a vast, sparsely populated country. And yet in economic terms, if you look at it down to the mid 17th century, um, you know, down to the end of the 17th century in Britain, there are four cities with a population of more than 20,000. London is vastly more than anywhere else. And then you've got Norwich, Bristol, and York. Poland, Lithuania has Danzig, which is one of Europe's great cities. It's not the size of London, but it's much bigger, much wealthier in the six, late 16th and early 17th century than Norwich. It's got Riga until 1621, which is again a great trading city. It's cities around the periphery there where they trade. And Poland, Lithuania, otherwise, is an agricultural country, and it's a very wealthy agricultural country. The great nobles that um, that Richard talked about benefit hugely from the Baltic grain trade. Some of them are among the most wealthy nobles in Europe. And one of the features that is not much talked about is that, oh, it doesn't have towns. Well, it does. Poland, Lithuania has a great number of towns. They're just very small, but they're appropriate towns for a largely agricultural economy, which function as market towns. There are also towns which are private cities. Oh my God, a private city that's actually owned by somebody. That's not right because history is about the conflict of the bourgeoisie with the nob nobility. But no, these private towns, some of the, a, a private magnet, a lot of work's been done in recent years on private cities and towns. They are magnificent places. Białystok, Zamość are built by the nobility, by great nobles. And they don't want to oppress their urban population. They give them Magdeburg law. They let them function as self-governing republics under the benevolent patrimony, patrimony, mostly speaking, of the lords. What goes wrong and what turns Poland, Lithuania into a poor country by the 1720s, 1730s is war. Because after 1648, Poland, Lithuania fights most of its wars at home on its own territory. Its military system, which, as I said, was decentralized, is torn apart. The local Sejmiks can't raise money anymore. The central Sejm can't raise money. Foreigners are raising money in Poland, Lithuania. And it's at war effectively from 1648 till 1721. And it destroys the impact on Poland, Lithuania of those wars is as great as the impact on Germany of the Thirty Years' War. And Germany lost a third of its population in the Thirty Years' War. In 1648, Poland, Lithuania is one of the great economic powers of Europe, although it's not Britain and it's not France. By the 18th century, it is different. So we have to ask what we mean by backward. And is that backwardness predicated upon what Britain does in the Industrial Revolution, which is not, as I remember, a 16th or 17th century phenomenon? Anyway, that's slightly provocative and controversial, but I will leave it there. Uh, if I if I may, uh, I, I do feel that I, I need to say just a few words, just because my presentation was basically trying to show that uh, even this there is this vision of Polish Lithuanian diplomacy as being backward. Uh, uh, it, 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 it was in some ways, but in some ways it was simply different. So thank you, Robert, for this for this apple banana comparison. I, I will definitely use it at some point. Thank you. If I might uh, add something, I know the question referred to the 16th and the 17th century, uh, but I think what happens in the 18th century is instructive and it sort of adds weight to the argument that has been uh, made. From a low point in the, about 1720 to a high point in the early 1790s, uh, the population, uh, particularly if you sort of take into account the, uh, uh, the, the losses of the partition, um, is actually sort of more than doubles. Uh, there is a great improvement in the cultivated area. Uh, fertility of soils also sort of improves. It does get warmer in the 18th century compared to the late 17th and early 18th, which helps. And there is quite dynamic social development. And by the end of the 18th century, some of those barriers between the nobility and the, uh, and the burghers are breaking down. 
Uh, there are all sorts of uh, perspectives that are beginning to be opened up for sort of, you know, for quite wealthy tenant farmers among the peasantry have the reforms of the four years same been allowed to, uh, to go further. And what we see in the later 1790s and early 1800s is a kind of freezing and even reversal of some of those uh, trends in social uh, mobility. The Prussian monarchy is very much a monarchy where the nobles know their place, the burghers know their place, and the peasants know their place. And there's far more flexibility uh, emerging by the early 1790s in the Commonwealth. And this in turn is, I think, one of the reasons for all, um, uh, which we can point to for explaining the partitions. So once this exceptional 75 year long crisis of war on its own soil is no longer there and the Commonwealth you know, despite its unfavorable geopolitical and fiscal military situation for most of the 18th century, you know, left to itself, it can develop. The potential is still there. And if I might come in on one of the features of backwardness that is often leveled at Poland Lithuania is the vexed question of serfdom. The idea that in England you have free yeoman farmers who um, are wealthy and that Poland Lithuania are tied to their landlords' estates. Um, there is, of course, um, an issue about serfdom, but that's the reason that Polish-Lithuanian agricultural products are so cheap, because they don't have labor costs. But um, the nobility has through the same control of taxation. And there's some very interesting work being done by Polish historians now on the economy of the, the manorial economy. And it points out, first of all, that because they're not taxed so heavily, because of the control of taxation by the noble thing. Nobles don't want their, their peasants to be taxed heavily. But actually, if you take in rent, labor rent, if you take in taxes, tithes paid to the church and all other dues levied on the peasantry, in the 16th and 17th century, the, the rural population of England and France were rather worse off than the rural population of Poland, Lithuania, because they were much more open to being burdened by their lords and, and, and tenants. Uh, their lords and, uh, and taxation than in Poland, Lithuania. And it was not in the, in the 15th century, actually, a lot of estates in Poland, Lithuania moved to labor service rather than cash rents. That was partly because the European economy had collapsed because of the Black Death. And there was no sense in producing for the market. And so for the peasants, it was very good to work on labor rent. And labor rents were, they tried to fix them to make sure that you only work one day a week by under Polish law. And the wealthy peasants that um, Richard mentioned, the Kmiecie, they don't, they don't do labor service. They have children or they have um, the rural poor who do it for them. And they get on and sell their pr products on the, on the market. What wrecks the system is the wars which means that the nobility get poorer and they have the only way they can raise their rents is to increase the burdens on the peasantry. And so that does impoverish the rural population. But backward is a very dangerous word. It's, it's this sort of British idea that we are brilliant and pioneering and the whole world ought to look like us. And if it doesn't, they're backward. 16th century Poland was a hell of a lot wealthier than 16th century Scotland, which is why tens of thousands of Scots left for Poland to work there. Thank you. I'm going to come very quickly because we're running out of time to a question that I've had from my colleague uh, Donatus Kopchunas, which I think is directly mostly uh, uh, Richard. Um, it's, he's, he asks, um, how, to what extent does all the criticism about Poland Lithuania, its way in life, its constitution uh, that was received in Britain and France, um, how, to what extent was that inspired by hostile German, Russian, or uh, Habsburg uh, narratives or influences? Well, that sort of criticism begins even before the partitions. I mean, Frederick the Great makes, uh, you know, has a great deal of fun uh, at the expense of his supposedly superstitious, fanatical, and barbaric and uncivilized neighbors. Uh, the actual effect of Hohenzollern rule uh, after the first partition in what had been Royal Prussian was now Westpreußen uh, was economically and socially catastrophic as Karin Friedrich and Hans-Jürgen Bermenburg 
uh, has shown you don't have to go to sort of Polish nationalist historians for that case uh, to uh, be made. Uh, and of course, you know, Catherine with her uh, sort of uh, favorite correspondence is also uh, showing this uh, view. Uh, but also it has to be said, some of the internal disputes, you know, there are problems, we need to address them, we need reforms. A lot of this leads to some quite searing criticism, which taken out of context can produce a rather sort of distorted uh, verdict. And this continues through the 19th century. Uh, we get the official historians like Treitschke in Prussia or Solovyov in Russia, you know, all having this interest in sort of damning the old Commonwealth as at best an exotic curiosity that you know, you know, is worth a place in a zoo perhaps. But uh, you know, but on the other hand, you've also got these sort of you know internal arguments among the success and the uh, uh, nations of the Commonwealth. There is a real sense of sort of you know the young Lithuanian national movement of the late 19th century turns its back on the sort of the old Polish sort of Lithuanian past and say, you know, where have these risings got us? You know, they too are buying into the idea of these sort of backward oppressive nobles who sold out to the Poles uh, rather than keeping their own culture. So, you know, they get a highly negative assessment coming from the great tradition of of Lithuanian national historiography coming through the 19th into the 20th century. Very similar uh, tale with, uh, with, with Ukraine, where in, there, of course, have been a great deal more violence uh, over uh, the centuries. Uh, and so if you put all these factors together, the idea, other than the you know, outrage defense of national honor, which some Poles have you know, done all the time, uh, it's been difficult to get to the kind of sort of more balanced and uh, historical uh, approach to assessing the Commonwealth in its own times. I too agree absolutely with the uh, with the comparison of apple and, uh, and and banana. It's something I try and get across to my students all the time. I give Robert sort of quotation of you know that the Commonwealth shouldn't be judged by not being what it never tried to be to the students as a kind of provocation at the start of the course. It, it's uh, banned the king from going to war without the permission of Parliament in the Henrician Articles and in 1611. And as we learned from the Iraq War, Westminster, the supposed mother of Parliament, hasn't got round to that yet. Any uh, any other quick comments, uh, Anna Robert, before we before we finish up? I mean, we're not saying that it was paradise and that it was all <laughs> everything was hunky dory. Of course, peasants were poor and there was oppression and there was all kinds of things going on. But it has been traduced over the years because precisely because it ended its existence in sixty in seventeen ninety five, and because it. Of the explanation it was because it didn't keep up with the rest of europe that's why backward is such a poisonous word when applied to poland lithuania and and i always i also did some um uh, did some work on the perception of poland lithuania in western europe and mostly in uh, in britain and when you read uh all kinds of descriptions, all kinds of publications where polish lithuanian is present when it's described you can see. I, I was, to be honest, I was I was quite surprised how uh, how repetitive how repetitive this material is. So basically, you've got one uh, one story uh, early in the 70th century, and then that would be repeated. It would be all the same, all the same. Uh, for example, the peasants. We talked about peasants. The peasants being treated like animals. That's something that was basically everywhere. When it comes to when it comes to perception, so. And yet, if you read travelers going through in the 17th century, they say how well managed the fields are, how prosperous it is, and. Um, but you know I, the problem. The the, the problem the, is. Th yeah, one of the problems is that actually its reputation was at its best when Poles wrote in Latin, that the rest of Europe could read. That's when they stopped true. writing I... in Latin and wrote in Polish, nobody could read it. And other other problem uh, uh, actually was that the travelers who were so impressed, they never published or barely ever published their their uh, descriptions in English in the 17th century. Only much much later. 
I think there's a lesson there now that uh, our Poles are increasingly speaking uh, excellent English. I think the reputation of Poland and Lithuania is, is going to improve. Uh, Lithuanians and Ukrainians too, of course. Well, I think that's a, that's a good note to end on it. Uh, and I always look forward to hearing more and more on Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. So uh, that would be fantastic. Um, yes, as I say, we're running out of time. Um, apologies if uh, I didn't get to any questions or queries that anybody uh, had. Um, I've certainly enjoyed the discussion. I hope everyone uh, listening in has too. Um, if we take anything away from it, we should say that Poland Lithuania is a banana, not necessarily an apple, perhaps. <laughs> so, um, Centre for Geopolitics, uh, please um, look out for more events from us. There is a one coming up on the 12th on the Army and the Union in the long 18th century. Uh, so, if you'd like to come along to that, please. Uh, sign up on the links provided in the chat. Uh, but for now, uh, I wish everyone a pleasant evening and thank you very much uh, for attending. Goodbye. <laughs>